Good evening. Last day of Hanukkah. And we're continuing our series. We're coming, actually, uh, we don't have that many more left as I thought. <coughs> Two weeks ago I said we ex I, uh, estimate another 20, maybe another five we should be done, that series. Anyway, so we spoke about many different topics in the last week about feeding the babies and about contagious disease and Birkat Kohanim, if you remember, all different kinds of problems with Kohanim. And today is the topic a little bit changing. The Ten Commandments that we got in Mount Sinai, the shape of the Ten Commandments were round or square? What do you think? Every shul you go, you look on the up, on top of the Aron Kodesh, not here, here there's no room, but they have the round shape. But in reality it wasn't round, it was square. Square and very heavy and big. Hamesh Amot is a... Huh? Yeah, Shesh, Vav, Vav, Shesh al Shesh, six Amot means like uh, 12 feet. It's very big. Moshe Rabbeinu also was very big. And plus, the luchot, the leathers of the luchot was actually carrying the, the luchot that you don't feel the gravity. So the shape was square, not round, like in most places. Next question, are we allowed to put the bicycle into the shul because we're afraid that people will steal them? <laughs> oh, the bicycle are here? They're not here, so I can answer that. <laughs> okay, Baruch <laughs> Hashem. The answer, the answer, Lebet Knesset lo, into the shul, no. But to Bet Midrash, yes. Place where he sits and learns, he is allowed to bring it in. Why? Because it's kind of like his home. But Bet Knesset, Aaron Kodesh, no. And definitely not to make a fashion show in Bet Knesset. Now when the Arabs made a mask in Me'arat HaMachpelah, which is also a shul from before, is that a problem to go pray in Me'arat HaMachpelah knowing there is a mask there also? In the same facility? The answer is no. Well, it, was, it was a Jewish site for more than 3,000 years. Just because one day the Arab invented a religion and then they try to force it on the world, we're going to change our uh, tradition and our truth? Of course not. Are we allowed to enter a shul of Karaites? In the past we spoke, we spoke in the past about reform and conservative and a church and a mosque and a Buddhist temple and Hinduism. We spoke about all this, but we hardly ever mentioned the Karaites, which are Jews that do not follow the oral Torah and today they became goyim. You don't know anymore if they're Jews or not, just like the Reform. Almost all of them became goyim, mixed with the goyim, their children are goyim. Nothing is left from them. The question is, are we allowed to enter the shul of the Karaites or no? The answer, no. They are kofrim, just like the Reform, same thing. Now allowed to enter one step into their shul. Can we make a meeting in the ladies section, a meeting, business meeting, inside the shul, in the ladies section. The answer, if it's kept respected, yes. Not like a, just a serious meeting, allowed. 
a rabbit center wants to give a lecture for the ladies inside the shul when knowing that they come not modest. They don't respect the place. They don't respect themselves. That's one problem, but you cannot dictate for them how they want to respect themselves or not. It's their life. But sometimes it's not what you want to do. It's the, it's the place where you're going to, right? You, she won't enter like this to a mosque, that's for sure. All these secular Israeli girls in Israel, who some of them forget how to dress, I mean, unfortunately, they won't dare to enter the way they dress into the mosque. But to a shul, who's going to say something? In a mask, she knows they chop her head off. <laughs> but in a synagogue, in a best case scenario, one of the ladies will bring something to put on her naked shoulders. That's the maximum that can happen. So she takes her chance. What's the worst can happen? Anyone, no one will have the guts to tell me anything. In a mask, as soon as Muhammad would see her, he'll bring his torch. <laughs> So the question now, if this is where Rebitzen wants to give her a shiur, but she knows the women comes inside the shul the way they dress, unfortunately. Is she allowed to still do it inside the shul, or she should move it into someone's house? The answer, not allowed to make the lecture in a shul. It's a disgrace for the house of God to let these ladies dress like, excuse my language, like animals. Animals don't dress. They don't need to dress. If a person holds on his body like a body of an animal and he's exposing it to the street, obviously he doesn't respect himself. He doesn't respect himself. He comes into the shul, into the synagogue. That's disrespect for Hashem now. It's not only to himself. So why do you wear it today in shul? Uh, they allow also in a shul for people to come with their motorcycle inside the shul and park it next to the Sefer Torah <laughs> and give them aliyah and a tap on the shoulder that is such a great tzaddik because he gave $36 donation yesterday. Mm-hmm. Allow a lot of things in this fake world that we live in. We never learn but what people are allowing. We learn but what the Torah is allowing. If we follow what people allow, Judaism will not have a memory of, maybe in some yeshivot. I I can give you an example from myself. There are many wicked people in the world. Every word that comes out of my mouth, they sit and wait. Like, you know how the tigers in the Discovery Channel are waiting for the zebra to show up? They basically don't miss a word of what I say. They dedicate their life to catch something that will be bombastic, that they can get tomorrow more attention on their lousy Facebook pages. That's all they live for. So the question that, I, that I'm asking you is now, can these people will, sh- will be able ever to show one sentence out of my mouth that wasn't according to the Torah? No. Of course not. Not even one sentence they won't be able to. But they still continue to bark. Non-stop. Why? That's the world we live in. In this world, everyone say whatever they want. The only the good news is that in this world, sometimes it looks like they get away with that. But when they come to the real world, they're going to pay for every bark they did. And the price will be tremendous. And that's why we say, Azimales Chok Finu. Then we can sit on the couch and relax and laugh to see all these wicked people pay for what they did. In the meantime, you have to tolerate their barking. One day, they'll pay the price. That's it. That's the good news, because you know no one gets away with what they did. And they will deal, they'll have to deal with the consequences, with all the Chilul Hashem they did, with the embarrassing, the Torah, when, all, when doing all kinds of other things. They'll pay for everything, not only for what they wrote, for what came out of it for the arguments, for the cursing, for the Chilul Hashem, for offending people, you know, it's a chain reaction. Their, their punishment is endless. They're endless. I once say, and some people got angry, I say, Hitler, he murdered the bodies. Eventually, Hashem pays him for six million or 30 million, as many millions of people, bodies. He killed bodies. Not, he didn't go after religion. He killed Jews. 
these people coming to destroy the Torah. You know, it's actually direct fight against Hashem. If you ask Hitler, if he believed in God, the answer is yes. Once my wife got a book from the library about the ideology of the Nazis, many of them believed strongly in God. They didn't follow the rules of the Torah, just like Christians. They believe in God, but they do everything the opposite. Just like Muslims, they believe in God, but half of them murdering people all the time. They want to murder everyone. Without it, they can't live. So what kind of belief is this in God? The Nazis also believe you have to kill the Jews, you have to kill the blacks, you have to kill the handicaps, you have to reorganize the world. Many times people declare they believe in God and they do everything the opposite. Many times people declare they don't believe in God but they actually follow some of his rules. Like this skeptic who debates me that he was giving us three hour speeches that he doesn't believe and he doesn't believe and in the end, the last second, he got up and blessed me Birkat Kohanim, which come from the Torah after criticizing the Torah for three hours. It just show you how people have no brain. They don't think. They just like robots. They, whatever comes, comes. People are not so cons cons consistent with what they declare. You have to stick to what you say. So now, the, the, but the point is, if the women comes not modest, you're not allowed to make the shiur inside. I one time went to a shul somewhere in Long Island. And it was, a bar, uh, it was a wedding, Shabbat of a wedding, and many of the family from one of the sides, the Chatan or the Kala, there were secular people who came with cars. And obviously secular people who come to show with car usually also have their cell phones in their pocket, and cell phones today are cameras. They're actually taking pictures in the middle of Shabbat. And the way they dress, I don't have to tell you. And the rabbi over there is Ish Emet doesn't take nonsense from anyone. You should see the shoutings and the screaming, how we started to scream at all this and kick them out of the shul, like dogs. So get out of here, you don't deserve to enter this place. Get out of your disgrace for, the, for, for Judaism, for the Torah. Shame on you, you're worse than animals. Kick them out of the shul. You know? What do you think? People tap on his shoulder and say, great for standing to keep the morals and the ethics of the Torah? No. Half of the people were criticizing him for weeks. Why? In a world of lies, don't expect any truth from the liars and the criminals. Look at the world, the United Nations. Here is a perfect example. Hundreds of votes, hundreds of condemnings, condemnations, all, everything against Israel. Not against anyone, not against Syria and Iraq and Iran and South Korea, North Korea. Everything from A to Z, I put on my Facebook page, all their votes, everything was always against Israel. Israel is the worst country in the world. Israel is democracy, foolish democracy. I wish one day they cancel this foolish democracy. But Israel giving rights to the murderers of Jewish children. Israel giving money to Arab spies who sell secrets to the Hezbollah. Israel gave billions of dollars a year to Palestinian murderers to help them to kill us faster. This is the sicknesses of Israel democracy. You understand? Israeli soldiers feed Palestinian children. In Syria, they murder 300,000 Arabs, not one condemning, nothing. What liars. This is the world of lies. The world of lies. Anyway, before we realize, we don't know. Maybe the problems in the world will come from North Korea. Yeah. You know, so when, when you fool, by the time you realize it, it may be too late. Imagine another provoca provocative act from uh, North Korea and in, in the United States, so today retaliated. They shut their internet for a few hours. <laughs> Nine, hours. Nine hours, no internet all over North Korea. Yeah. I wonder how Obama agreed to such a thing. It's so much unlike him. <laughs> Maybe he was sitting home and biting his nails. Huh? He likes the movies better. Ah, he likes the movie, ah, because of the movie. For the movie, he became a hero. <laughs> anyway, so you know what? You think they're going to be quiet this, with their ego, this fanatic lunatics? 
they probably will retaliate against America, and they will retaliate, and they will retaliate, and eventually they have nuclear bomb. You know? That's the scary part. Because America, you hope that they will not drop an atomic bomb again. They did that mistake once. They'll be more very, very careful not to repeat that horror. But North Korea, what you can expect from these crazy people? Can you expect from Iran not to throw an atomic bomb? It's a miracle that Pakistan did not drop a bomb yet. The only reason they didn't, because India also have one. They'll retaliate, probably. So they know what's the point. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. So if a person is praying in one shul every day, does he have to pray in the same place, or it's not so critical? We know that uh, the Gemara said that a person has to set the place for his tefillah. The question is, if somebody set in his place, is it a big deal to ask him nicely to move? because it's routine place, or better to ignore it and just sit somewhere else, and no problem. The answer, it's not an obligation. It's a good advice. Definitely to offend someone that innocently sat in your place because you didn't know, better to just sit somewhere else and finish. If it becomes an everyday thing, let's say someone moved to the neighborhood, you sit there for 10 years, and now, today he said, he said nobody, saw, nobody told him anything. Tomorrow, again, the same place. You still don't say anything. Two, three times, you see, like the place. You ask him, excuse me, you know, I'm sitting here for 10 years. Do you mind sitting over there? That's it in a nice way, quietly, not in front of people. But if it's a one-time uh, incident, better to let go. My grandmother had... Uh, an assistant, she's from the Philippines, non-Jew. She takes care of her. In Israel, it's a very common thing that uh, women from Philippines, even men, they take care of old people. Are we allowed to bring her into the shul? Because they push the wheelchair, she, they bring their water. She comes inside, inside the shul. <coughs> so if she comes in, you allowed to bring her in or no? Yes. The answer, yes, you can bring her in. She serves one, per, one person that needs help. But what happens if she has a cross with JC hanging like this? <laughs> and she wants to bring her into the shul? No. No, huh? no. The answer, you have to ask from her nicely to remove it. Because these things is uh, not allowed to bring it into the place of holiness. Is it giving it power? No, you're not giving it power. All the idols don't have any power. But Hashem, Hashem still say to destroy it from the face of the earth. Not that Hashem thought that the idol that the goy made gives them any power. Of course not. You understand? But it's a, it's, it's a matter of disrespect to the real God. When you take a tree and make it a God, it's a sign of disrespect to the real God. You understand? When you have a big rabbi in a place and somebody else who doesn't know 1% from him, and you ask all your questions from the one who doesn't know 1%, you're not really directly offending the big rabbi, but <coughs> indirectly you disrespect him. Why the, if Rav Ovadia was here, sitting here, Zatzal, and any rabbi in, here in America would sit next to him, and you would ask only that rabbi and ignore the biggest rabbi in the world. That would be a big uh, disrespect for him, right? So it's like everything else in life. Same thing doctors. If you have a beginner doctor who just came out of a medical school yesterday, and a doctor is 70 years old already, and you ask only the young one, and you, don't, and you ignore the ones, it's disrespecting him. Same thing teacher, same thing in everything in life. Christians praying inside the hotel, inside the shul. In a hotel, some hotels in Israel, they have synagogues. The Christians went in, and they started to pray. What are we going to do now? Huh? Wait until we finish. Wait until they finish, or call the security? Wait until they finish. 
The answer, call the security and stop them immediately. The question is, what happened if you didn't see it and they pray there and that's it, they're done? What's the, the shul is still kosher or this shul is finished? Because the idol worshippers went in. The idol worshippers impure the place with their despicable idol worshipping. It's not only Christian, all idol worshippings. Islam, by the way, even though it's a very violent religion, even though they try to describe it as the, as the, as the religion of peace, <laughs> it's very, very strange how they even have the nerve to, to try such a, it's like they say in America, nice try. It's not even nice, it's ridiculous try. But anyway, Islam is a very, very violent religion, but it's not idol worshipping. So they're not idol worshippers. But Christians, even though they give you their fake smiles, brothers, we love you, this, that, and even donate money to Israel, it's idol worshipping. So, so the shul is not dismissed. The shul is still a shul. You can see Magen Avraham, also Igrot Moshe, they ask him this question, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Ora Chaim Aleph Mem Vav, that's the source. Are we allowed to give a secular lecture inside the shul? Secular lecture about the Israeli army and, uh, and his victory on the Six Day War. I want to give a lecture. Professor for physics or math, he wants to give a lecture about math. Somebody wants to speak about the, the election that is coming. Someone wants to speak about the rights of social security of Israeli who immigrated to the United States. They're looking for a place to, to, to do it. So they, they want to come and do it in the shul. Allowed or not allowed? The answer, not allowed. Shul is meant for holy, not for business, everyday business, to give lectures over there about uh, secular uh, subjects. In the time of the Holocaust, the only place they could gather was in shuls. They ask a big rabbi, his name was the Sride Esh. Rabbi, we can only gather in a shul. So if, you don't, if we're not going to do it here, we're going to have to go to the shuls of the reforms. The reforms in Germany, they were very, very strong. They had big shuls, lots of money, just like in America, same story. We see what was the end of it. We saw. But in the meantime, they had power. So he said, if the speaker is Yeresh Amayim, someone righteous, even though he speaks about a secular subject, but he himself is Yeresh Amayim, and the only place to gather in the time of the Nazis was there, right? And there are not going to be any arguments or disrespect to the place. Bishat Atchak, when there's really, really no other choice, they should do it there. But not if they bring a clown with a horse tail and earrings and shorts, and he comes to speak about playing soccer in Israeli league on Shabbat. They want to make a convention inside the shul. That's already a disgrace, or fashion show, like they just did. Can we hug friends in shul? Like you saw someone, hi, buddy, how are you? Hugs, kisses. Some, some nationalities in, in among the Jews, there's no way to say hello without kissing, like the Arab. Mwah, mwah. You know? Even Rabin kissed with Arafat, if I remember correctly. Huh? The question is, some, you know, warm Middle Eastern style Jews, they like to kiss an hug. The question is, you come into their shul, everyone kiss you. 500 different perfumes. <laughs> you have all over you now. The question is, is it disrespect to the place or no? Yes. Oh. But he says, you're allowed to kiss, if someone wants to kiss the rabbi's hand out of respect, that's, I, I read it's allowed. Kiss the rabbi's hand, of course. But not allowed to kiss each other, not to kiss children in shul as well. Oh, the rabbi says even children in shul. No, no, it's just... A person cannot even hug and kiss his own kids. Right. 
inside the shoes. It shows against the Hashem. Right. Right. But this is one of the laws that basically almost nobody pay attention to. They said that Rav Moshe Feinstein, the holy big tzaddik Talmud Chacham, maybe the biggest in the history of America, that he was kissing his grandchildren inside Bet Midrash of Tiferet Yerushalayim in Lower East Side, East Broadway. Because he, his opinion was that the halacha not to show empathy and love inside the shul, inside the Bet Midrash, is only in the middle of the prayer, not after we finish and you sit there or before. Just in the middle of praying, you have to focus on your prayers. You don't start kissing and hugging, and you know how kids are. He begins to talk to you, and you forget, and you talk, and you cut your, your prayers in the middle, which makes a lot, of, a lot of sense. But after that, why not? Why not to kiss your grandson? Uh, it's mitzvah. No problem. <laughs> After, after that, you have who to count on. If you have such a giant chacham that allows it, then you can always count on it. This is the general rule. Even though there, there's another general rule that everyone follows his own rabbi, a selich rav. But if a person did not follow his rabbi in a specific law, and he counted on one very big chacham, it's a good question, Behemet, to begin with. What's not disres what's disrespect here? I tell you why. I give you, I, t I, t I prove to you now. Here, Hashem gave me an idea. If I go now with my, uh, with my son, and they made me a meeting with Obama, and I waited six months that Obi will agree to meet me. And I walked in, and now Obama is in front of me, and I go to my son, mwah, mwah, how are you, sweetie? You drank your iced tea? It's disrespect to Obama, no? In America, it's in style to disrespect the president. The freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. All the democracy countries, everyone abuse their leader. Nobody respects him. It's become a culture. It's actually the more you abuse him and the more you make fun at him, the greater you are. <laughs> Do you understand what's going on? But in, in, in other countries, when you have a king, if you say one thing in the media against your king, your, your life is over. And that's the way it should be. Freedom of speech has to have a lot of limitation. They went way too far. Freedom of speech, you have to respect the right people. You understand? And not only that, you, in the freedom of speech, you're not allowed to say negative information about anyone in public. You're not a judge, and you don't have the right to destroy people's life, even if it's true. Even if what you're about to write in the internet about someone, it's 100% true. But who's to say that God agreed that he's going to suffer so much from a tiny sin that he made or something negative about him? Why is children has to suffer? Why his wife and the parents has to suffer? So many innocent people going together hurt, and their life will be over for your stupidity and your wicked, evil heart. It has to be a limit to this freedom of speech. It cannot be. We all forget that. If the rule would be, even the people that are about to speak about, they would think a million times before. Understand? But unfortunately, I say that the first rule they have to make in the whole world is that everyone who ever entered the internet to any website and anyone who ever write any comments on the internet in any website, his IP address must be revealed, which means he cannot write a phony name. He has to do it with his name. You don't want to be published, don't make comments. You want to make comments, you have to be responsible for your comments. If your comments cause damage, someone has the right to sue you and to collect from you for the damage that you made. If you ruin his business, you have to pay for it. You cannot hide behind fake names. It's coward. That's the first law that the world must, be, must have. Otherwise, it will be the end of the world soon. If it's continued the way it is, the world will be over. Even now in Israel, by the religious parties, you know what's going to happen now? Almost all of them will not make it to the government. Because in Israel, I believe you need four mandates. 
you need four mandats, which is about 200,000 people, to be able to enter the Knesset after the election. So therefore now, I'll give you an example. The Sfaradim, when Rav Ovadia was alive, they used to get 11 mandats, which is very respectful. Now, after he passed away, the survey show eight. Now they're splitting. So today's survey show four and four, which means it's right on the border. It's very logical that none of them will make it. Eight mandats went to the garbage. You understand? Eight mandats is maybe hundreds of millions of dollars to the Torah that will go to the garbage because this disagreement, and it's all about ego and power and control and Lashon Hara, and it's all because of the internet. If there's no internet, everything will be in one block in Yerushalayim, all in private meetings. No one will even know what's going on. No one would add oil to the fire. Eventually, it would be different. Now, everyone writes, making up stories, he's a murderer, I saw him doing that. And, and people believe everything they read, and they destroy, everyone destroy everyone. And of course, Hashem say, you know what? You're such losers, you're so wicked, you don't deserve even to get anything. And everyone would stay out, and in the end, we'll pay the price. That's what happens when there's no unity and there's evil hearts. By the Ashkenazim, same story. Same story. Degel and Aguda and all these groups, everyone fights with everyone. Who oh, Rav Eliashiv passed away, so now they now more brave against his people, and the people of Rav Shach, and the people of this, and the Chabad. Everyone fights against everyone. If the religious people will all be united, they'll be bigger than the Likud. They will be a religious prime minister. If Shas and the Ashkenazim, and many other religious members of the Israeli government will all join together, you are talking about 25 mandats, which is more than the Likud and the liberal Jews, which means the one who gets the most amount of seats in the Knesset, he is the first one that the president offer him to be the prime minister, if he will get 61 members joining him, which means it will be a religious one. Do you understand what it means, a religious prime minister? Do you know what power it is? Do you know how much more the Torah would be protected, and the yeshivot, and less porks, and intermarriage, and all this fake conversion, so many bad things that they passed, they'll not be able to make a peep for four years while there's a religious prime minister. Because everyone will be afraid to get fired. You bark too much. Like Bibi fired those two Rishayim. In one minute, he fired both of them. They lost everything. Prime Minister can fire you, which means you will think a million times before you speak against his religion when you know he goes three times a day to shul. <laughs> right? If I, leave, if I go now to Syria, will I dare to speak about, against the Islam? If I want to commit suicide, yes. <laughs> but I'll be there now. Excuse me, Muhammad and Ahmed, come all of you, I have something to tell you. Before I finish the first sentence, they'll play soccer with my head. The, the reason we don't have a religious prime minister, it's our fault. Because the Sfaradim are not united, the Ashkenazim are not united, and the Sfaradim and the Ashkenazim also are not united. So it's so many lack of unities combined together that will break us to five different small groups, which each group is worthless. Each group is worthless. If everyone together will be united, which we all serve and run after the same Torah, it's very stupid. 99.9% .9 of the things we do, it's equal. For the 0.1% differences that we have between us, we're paying the price. And it's all about ego. It's all about power, money, ego, all negative reasons. It's against the Torah to have ego. Uh, it's against them. Many things are against the Torah. We are, we are not exactly perfect. I always ask, why don't they go to the biggest rabbis and let them decide, because they know more Torah. Because even the biggest rabbis are not united. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you went to Rav Shach and asked him, and then you went to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and you asked him, do you know what kind of a war you would, we would create? You understand? And even now, you ask Rav Eliashiv a question, then you ask Rav Ovadia a question, there's different uh, Ashkafa in certain things. Again, 99% is the same. You ask about Shabbat, everyone will give you the same answer. You ask about conversion, 
almost everyone will give you the same answer. You ask about kosher food, you get the same answer. But there are issues that are not 100% religion. If you're allowed to give uh, uh, the land of Israel to the Arab murderers, if they will leave you in peace, which means they won't kill you. Is it worth it to give them land that they will leave you alone? That's a very, today it's a very naive question. But maybe 30 years ago, people still believe this fairy tale. You know? You know, by the way, I saw a letter yesterday that Rav Ovadia Yosef wrote to the Kipot Srugot, to the, the Jews in Israel, the Zionist, religious Zionist. He wrote to them that uh, he's taking back any decision he made related to the Oslo Agreement when the liberal lefty Jews were spreading so many lies that the Arabs are promising and they will stop and if we make this Oslo agreement. And in, re in reality, in the end, we gave them land and we only got bombs and missiles on our head. So he, way years back, most people do not know it. I saw the actual handwriting of Slater that he said that he was misled by the general and by the politicians. The information they gave him were all lies. If he really knew the truth, he would never agree to allow the government to do it. He would scream against it. But the problem is that a politician has an agenda. You know, there's hidden things that he is going to get from this move. So even if he doesn't believe in the move, it's worth it for him to compromise with his enemy in politics if he's going to get his enemy to compromise with him in other issues. But the rabbi doesn't do this calculation. The rabbi has to answer what's real for this issue, not for another issue. Right now we're dealing with this. He has to give the right answer. But if you give him lies, if you say there's no risk, they cannot shoot, we're going to hold their money, they have too much to lose, you give him information that is incorrect, what comes in the end? Sirens. You hear? That's what comes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I allowed to donate uh, Sam's book to the shul and write that all the reading in this book will be to my success? <laughs> <laughs> what a nice guy. <laughs> a question. He writes in the beginning. By the way, I've seen it in some places. This will be, but, well, if someone writes for the health of my father, nobody cares. Everyone wants his father to be cured. But why do I have to read Tehillim that you be rich? <laughs> That's already a different story. You tell me you're sick, okay, I'm willing to read Tehillim for your health. Or other issues, or you're in jail, you want to come out. Okay, we read Tehillim for you. Just because you want your 10 million to become 20 million, I'm going to read Tehillim all day and everything will go to you, that you can have another 10 million? Everything goes to him. If that's what he writes, condition, he writes in the Tehillim, all the reading of Tehillim in this book will be to my merit only. Signing, plony ben plony. Finished. And now you see it and you read. All the Tehillim goes to him. And not to you at all. Mm -hmm. It goes to the person who reads it too. Two. The word two, it's very important what you say. <laughs> two. How much more? 5% he gets? 10? Only Hashem knows how to calculate these things. So the question is, we allowed the answer if you write it in big letters that everyone can see it. Like you put a sticker on the top, right here, on the top, not inside, in between the pages that people may not see it. Because not everyone sees the first page if there's uh, messages. Right away, they open in the middle where they want to read. So if you write here that you cannot miss it, this, the learning or reading in this book will be for the success of this and this and that. And the people still want to read. Why not? What did you do illegal here? You gave them an option, and they took it. But if you s trick them inside, and they, then they can see it, that's not good. Where does it say in Shulchan Aruch not to bring children to shul when they disturb the public? Or maybe the rabbis say it because the kids make too much noise when they speak. 
What's the problem? Let the kids speak and scream and run around and take their skirts off. You know, like it happens sometimes in a shul. He brings a little girl, two or three years old, in the middle of prayer. She decided to go on the stage, roll around, you know. And everyone is embarrassed over there. And his father is stuck because he cannot walk in the middle. I have to tell you well, how embarrassing this moment is. The answer, Shulchan Aruch, Ora Chaim, Tzadik Chet, Mem Bet Gimel. Now, Seuda in Shul. Are we allowed to make a meal inside the Shul? Mix meal inside the shul, for sure it's not allowed. Men, women, all mixed. Inside the shul, not allowed. However, if they have a dining room, like some shuls have a separate section, different room, upstairs, downstairs, whatever, different thing, they can do meals over there. Hence, to eat inside the shul, it's disrespect for the place. Mixed meals, to begin with, it's a problem. It's a problem. However, in Bishat Atchak, when there's really no other choice, let's say you have a lot of guests that are not even religious. They came to your party or bar mitzvah or whatever. If you tell them to go sit over there and their wife's over there, they're going to make big noise. We're not talking dancing. Mixed dancing, it's one of the worst things that you can think of. No permission, no matter under what circumstances, even if the wedding will get canceled and there's not going to be a wedding and they're never going to get married, or the bar mitzvah will be canceled, or the brit milah will be canceled, you're still not allowed to allow mixed dancing. Nothing permits it. Nothing. To make mixed dancing between men and women. It's a horrible crime. You should know that. If the people would know what they're causing when they get married like this, they will think a million times before. Are you supposed to walk out a woman, not a man? Even a woman, I tell you why. A woman, the last thing on her mind is to see other women dance in front of her, if she's normal. Well, <laughs> they not, you, know, you don't know anymore what's going on in this world. If she's normal. So the last thing in her mind is to see some woman with their high heels dancing like this in front of her. By a man, it's a different story. It brings his mind to think bad things, forbidden thoughts. By a woman, there's really no issue of modesty here. It's not such an, such an issue of modesty. So why would I say that a woman also cannot participate in a mixed dancing wedding or party? Why? Because this party is a rebellion against Hashem. All the people there together, unanimously rebel against God. Do you want to stand next to them when they make such a horrible crime? Who think that there is a permission to join Korach and Adato when they spit in the face of Moshe Rabbeinu and say, I'm only standing here? You stand in their side. Moshe is standing here with Aaron, 250 Reshaim standing here. And you say, I'm only here. I'm not really supporting what they say. So why are you standing next to them? You have to stay away from them. You don't go and put yourself with the wicked people when they make such a crime. Hashem is crying and you want to be there? A Jew marry a Goya, you want to participate in such a crime? You're against it. It breaks your heart, fine, we know it. But why are you, why are you showing up? Why? Because he's my friend. We're working together, who cares? Who cares, does he have the right to be offended? He's making the biggest crime in the Torah, and he still have the rights to get offended? It's lucky you even talk to him, Bechlal. Really, logically, somebody like this doesn't deserve that anyone would talk to him for rebelling against Hashem so much. But we are very lenient today. Okay, for the peace, for the peace. We have a way out. Get out of free, free, free get out of jail card. For the peace, Leshem Shalom, for peace, peace, peace. For peace, for peace, for peace, for peace. I even heard this one rabbi, he said to his wife, if your husband forces you to get in a car on Shabbat, you're allowed for the peace. <laughs> for the peace, everything is allowed. Next thing, you're allowed to murder someone for your husband if he gets angry. That's what's happening. And there's no spine, no solid ground, no solid foundation. 
And that's what happened. Can we do netilat yadaim with water from the ocean? Like water with the salt, very salty water, and do netilat yadaim. Can we do or not? The answer, no. Salty water, no. However, you can dip your hands inside. You can dip it like a mikveh. But to take the water out and do netila, no. Cup, cup. I'm talking with a cup. You're in a picnic now. You're in a, in a, in a, in a dead sea. Over there, dead sea, salty water. You want to take water and use them. Yeah. How is it supposed to work out with the whole big seating from the top of the floor, but separate dancing? Aren't the, aren't the guys on the other side still be able to see the middle dancing? A hundred percent, I'm with you. But what can I do that there was Rav Moshe Feinstein that says that if there's no other way, and the only way they can make the wedding is, is actually seats together, husband and wife, husband and wife, husband and wife, brother, sister, sitting together, but making a separate uh, dancing. If the Chacham wrote it, that means there has to be a way. He thought about all possibilities. It's hard, you're right, because you have to do the dance floor in such a way that it's surrounded completely from all directions. And also between the men and the women, there's a separation. While otherwise, if you only make a nice kosher separation between the male and the female, if it's surrounded with tables all around, then, then all the men sitting in front of the women dancing. So what did you do by that? So the only way to do it is to block the entire dance area like you do in a ghetto, which makes the wedding not so pretty. Uh, all of a sudden, you have walls everywhere. What can you do? If that's the way they want to make their wedding, when men and me women sit together, I always say, if you want to make shalom bite between a husband and wife that hate, hate each other, all you have to do, instead of spending $300 a session by marriage counselor, all you have to do is to bring them to a wedding in Borough Park or Williamsburg or Muncie, separate religious wedding, and you see how they fall in love together with each other immediately. What do I mean? They come to the wedding, and there's always the men over there say, excuse me, ma'am, ladies to the right, men to the left. What? What does it mean? So it's a separate wedding. The woman is there, and the man is there. What? I'm not going to sit with my husband? Moshe, come, let's go. What is this? You tell me where to sit? There's no freedom. It's the United States. We're in the 21st century. What is this, Iran here? <laughs> Moshe, come here, I said. Hey, come on, don't make a big deal out of it. And all of a sudden, they're in love again. They can't even be apart from each other for two hours. Wow, what a beautiful devotion, no? She's willing to make a scandal, everyone looking at her screaming. Just five minutes ago in a the car, they were beating each other, wait until you see what's going to be tomorrow. But as soon as they came to the wedding, ah, it's like the chupa, the night. Baruch <laughs> Hashem. It's 100% true. Ay, 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 ay. <coughs> Am I allowed to enter a reform shul not to pray, to do work over there? I'm an electrician. They gave me a job over there. The light don't work. The answer, not allowed, even if they offer you a million dollar cash. Not allowed to step into this filthy place called a reform shul. Not to step inside. Same thing church. But a mask, you can fix inside. If it's for money. Yes. But reform, not allowed to step. It's maritime. Maritime. And also tum'ah. It's also Tuma, impurity of the place. It's two problems, Maritain and Tuma. Next question. Tuma of the wicked people and Kfira in Hashem and Avodah Zarah. Yeah. Tell me one thing. If now I'll take you to a reform shul, and before we enter, 
I'll tell you that yesterday they made a bar mitzvah to a dog and they bought filin and put it on his head. Okay. And the night before, one woman married her dog over there. Would you still want to enter that place? That's what's happening in these places. What do you think happening there? And two nights ago, three nights ago, Itzik and Christine just got married there with the priest and the rabbi together hugging and kissing. JC and Moses. That's what's happening there. It's about time to people to open up their head and realize what these places are. What do you think they are? What do you think they are? If a guest comes to our house, well, do we have an obligation to serve him food or drink or not? Is it an obligation or is nice way and manners and hospitality? And there's a, is there an obligation? Which means if I did not serve him anything, did I violate the rules of the Torah or no? He was hungry. You're going to start asking your guests if they're hungry? What are you going to do? They say yes. What are you going to do? I'm sure some people, when they will hear this video tomorrow, <laughs> they say, who, who even asks such a question? Of course, someone comes to your house. What kind of Jew you are? You open the table right away. Wow. <laughs> By some places, if you don't eat, they get very offended. Yeah. So the answer is, the answer is there's no obligation, but it's very, very, very recommended. And someone who doesn't do it will regret it deeply one day, that he had an opportunity to earn a ticket to life of eternity, and for five dollars being stingy, he just lost it. Because what's the... The, the, the Mishnah say there are mitzvot that you can eat from the fruits in this world, but the actual reward is waiting for you to the world to come. One of them is achnasat orchim, which is chesed. Do we have an obligation to go to the bathroom before we start a new meal if we need the bathroom? Or we can quickly eat the new meal and then go to the bathroom? Is it an obligation or it's just good recommendation of Chazal and the Rambam for a good health? The answer, it's an obligation. Person that knows that things that he does damage his body has no permission to do those things. And one of the things they say, that when a person has to go to the bathroom to clean his stomach, it's not good and healthy to eat a new meal. First he has to clean his body, then to sit and eat the new meal, which means it's a matter of, as a matter of medican, medical, medical matter. And medical, it's an obligation. They don't do things that we know that are damaging the body. The way of the righteous people who used to torture themselves by almost eating nothing, drinking a little water and eating bread only, living in very mo the most simple way, isn't it against Judaism? Because we know that when Hashem wanted Jews to, to suffer, He gave them one day a year, Yom Kippur. The highlight is on that day to fast, no relation, you know, all kinds of things that you're not allowed to do. But the rest of the year, no problem. Hashem, it's no problem. You eat a good cream cake or a good steak. So why those rabbis over the generations, almost all the big holy ones, they live such simple life? The most poor place, everything by them was very simple. Nothing was tag name. The meal was very, very small, even if they had money. Even the one that had money. So the question is why? Why do they feel an obligation to live such life? They were on a spiritual level. Their Kaduri ate once a week. Uh, he was eating very little of Kaduri, for sure, but I don't know about once a week. Huh? The question is, was it a mitzvah? Was it an obligation? Or was it a sin? So to say that it was a sin, obviously it's chutzpah. If so many thousands of holy people, the holiest people in history, not all, many of them live such simple life and ate very little, and even the things that they ate was very, very down to earth, obviously it could not be a sin. But what happens if we do the same? Then it becomes a sin. Then it's become Christianity. So how can it be? It looks like a huge contradiction here. 
The answer is no. If you're in a very, very high level, if you're in such a spiritual level, you don't need the material world completely. You don't need it. You don't have, you're not running after flavors, after health, after sport, beautiful things, views, vacation. You don't care about this thing. Not only you don't care, it's a torture for you to waste time on it. So what's the, uh, the easiest way? Like Rabbi Tzion Abba Shaul, one slice of bread, dip it in a coffee to make it soft because it was three days old. Makes it soft, eat it, once in a while tomato, that's it. Nothing, seeding, steak, chicken, bringing salad, appetize, rabbi, here, put your napkin here, let's move it here. Which kind of whiskey you like, Vodarav? No, very little, two minutes, that's it. Breakfast, two minutes. Lunch, two minutes. Dinner, two minutes. Here you go, six minutes a day food. Not like today. Two hours to make the meal. <laughs> An hour to sit and eat very, very little because you don't want to lose the, 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 the pleasure. You don't want quickly to fin. You want the pleasure to last. So another hour, and then two hours to prepare lunch, one hour to eat lunch, two hours to prepare dinner, one hour to eat dinner, and all your life you're sitting in a dining room. Beautiful, and weight 500 pounds. <laughs> the answer is, of course, that's not the right way. So great people, which we don't have that many left in the world in a very, very high spiritual level, they are exception to the rule. But please make no mistake, the rule is to eat healthy, to eat good, to sleep good, not to look for tortures. Not to go and roll in the ice, in the snow. You're not the Ariya Kadosh. You're not the Benishcha, you're not the Babasali, you're not the Gaon Mivilna. When you be one of them, then we'll talk about all these tikkunim. In the meantime, you must eat wafers and cream cake because this is who you are. And don't be a faker. And enough with this show of two months is in yeshiva, already parush min haolam. Soon as his beard started to grow. <laughs> Come on, I mean, people thinking of themselves like everyone thinks two weeks is learning, already he thinks it's the, the Gaon Mivilna. What about the Indian of fasting Mondays and Thursdays? Monday, Thursdays, you know, it's days that are better for, for Achamim. We see from the reading in the Torah, Monday and Thursday only, and besides Shabbat. To fast, in general, in this generation, Rav Uvadi Yosef says it's not a good idea. People are weak. They're not what they used to be. In the old days, it was a piece of cake for them to fast. Nobody cared. Fast, fast. People were very strong. Today, someone who fasts by 1 p.m. already is becoming dizzy already. He can't function. So if he works for someone, he works not as good. Let's say you're waiter in a restaurant. You have to serve, and you're fasting. You smell all this food. You didn't have your drink, your coffee. The caffeine is now going to your brain. You have headache, you're very weak, and it makes you also sad and upset and nervous. And, you know, and now you're not functioning 100%, only 70%. But your boss is still paying you full salary, so right here you have stealing. You're doing your job 30% worse than you're supposed to. If you're a teacher in Talmud Torah, you teach the children, you're not focusing as much. If you learn in yeshiva, you don't learn as good. You see, some yeshivot by one o'clock, half of the people go to sleep already in a day of fast. Why? They say to the rabbi, it's very hard for me to focus. I didn't have my two cups of coffee today. I can't function. People are very weak physically today, very weak. And therefore, some people who sponsor the yeshiva, why they sponsor the yeshiva? Because they love the color of your eyes? Because they want you to make their bank account in life of eternity loaded. That's what it is. Nobody gives you money for your beautiful hair and your nice nose. People give money because they know you sit and you learn Torah. Two things in their mind. It makes Hashem happy that Jews are learning Torah and I want to have a share in it. And it also make my bank account the important bank account, not Citibank here. Over here soon, it will be over. The real bank account is going to be loaded. That's why I give money to yeshiva and kiruv to make CDs even better. Endless profit. Why does he give you the CD? It makes him cry at home from happiness that you learn, now you're putting CD and you're learning Torah in your, in your car. 
Some people, yes, if they're very holy. Most people, it's pure greed. I'll spend thousands of dollars for CDs every month. Many of the Jews become religious. My bank accounts explode from profit, and it's eternal profit. It saves me from tragedies. It saves me from the government. It saves my children. It saves my health. And the most important thing, it sets my olam, my next eternal life to be in the highest level, as the Zohar promised. So why not to invest money in the right cause? So when people invest money, it's not a shame to admit that they do it because they want also to have personal gain. Also, only for personal gain, it's kosher, but it doesn't smell good. For personal gain, and also to make Hashem happy, and to make people more religious, and to make the world a better place, lots of profits from all directions. David HaMelech wrote in Tehilim, Shamarti Toratecha, I observe your Torah. How does this Pasuk? Alasachar asher tzafanta li re'echa. For the reward that you put aside for those who fear you. Which means a part of the reason why I'm working on myself to be so holy and to be so righteous and to be chassid. The Gemara says it was midat chassidut, even higher than Shaul, which the Gemara says was a very big tzaddik. And David Amele chassid, ki chassid ani, it says. And Hashem agreed. It's in the Tanakh. Hashem confirmed. So it's midat chassidut, higher than righteous. So he wrote, why? Am I killing myself to be such a righteous, holy person? One of the reasons for the huge reward you promise to your followers. That's it. Well, that's an answer. If somebody ever asks you, why are you doing it for the reward? You give them this pasuk from Tehillim. However, the Pirkei Avot say, don't serve the rabbi in order for you to get a reward from him. <coughs> Serve it, serve him, in order for you not to get reward. But which rabbi are they talking about? The real one, the chief rabbi of the world, the creator of the world. Don't do everything just for the reward. It will drive you crazy, the calculation. Do it for the sake of the mitzvah. But on top of it, wow, I'm earning so much, no problem, it's not a contradiction. I guess what I'm saying is, is like this, listen. If you only do what you know you get rewarded, that's not good. Which means if they come and say to you, can you do this mitzvah, but you won't get the reward. Sign that you're giving up the reward. Would you still do it? If yes, then you're 100% kosher. No problem. Here, I show that I'm willing to do it even without the reward. I give you, an, I give you a good advice. Sometimes you want to do something, but Hashem doesn't give you this, this, this merit. He doesn't give it to you. So why does Hashem doesn't give you this merit? So you don't deserve it. He doesn't want to give you such a huge reward. So he doesn't give you the opportunity. So what should you do? You should pray to Hashem, I want to do this big mitzvah. If I don't have the merit to do this mitzvah, which means the Satan, the Satan, is objecting in a court of heaven. He wanted to make a very big lecture in your house for a very big speaker. You're working on it, and it's not working out. Every time it gets canceled, the dates don't work, people oppose it, the neighbor give out time, your wife doesn't want. It could be a lot of reasons. So you pray to Hashem, maybe I don't have the merit, so that's why I'm not getting this, this chut, this mitzvah. <coughs> so I'm declaring to you, I'm willing to do it, not for reward. What do you have to lose? You don't have to pay me. I'm giving up the reward. Let me do this mitzvah anyway. That's a very good sign. Why? It shows to Hashem that you're not only doing for reward. If you get the reward, you're very happy. If for whatever reason there's no reward and you're about to lose the mitzvah because you don't deserve the reward, so off, offer to Hashem, I'll do it for free. No problem. If you do it a few times like that, eventually you'll have the merit to get the reward because you're now going to a much higher level. Much higher level. I, I met one time a guy who was very rich, and I said to him, invest in Kiruv and in Yeshiva. 
all your money give to Kiruv and to Yeshiva. Don't give to anything else, just to those two. That's the highest reward. So he said to me, I don't care about the reward. I don't care about the reward. I said to him, why? I'm giving you an advice. You're anyway investing the same amount of money. Over here, you're going to get a million times more reward. And he said, I don't want to even think about the reward. Whatever the cause is necessary at the moment, use this money for it. Now, I, I, until today, I have a dilemma if this guy was such a big tzaddik or he was a total fool. <laughs> I still did not come up with the answer. Why? When it comes to investments in life, everyone wants to get the highest profit on their money. No one is so generous to tell the stock broker, invest it anywhere you want. <laughs> Someone like that doesn't even need a stock broker. He comes to the computer in the morning, he clicks, stocks, thousand name come, he say, and then Dino, oh, what is this stock? I don't know, thousand dollars. Over here, what's this? Five thousand. Over here, no, no. Shirla Ma'alot, Sainai Larim, whatever happened, happened. Why? I don't do it for the, for the, for the profit. <laughs> I don't care about the profit. Someone like that, he needs an evaluation in a barbanel. However, if he's really such a tzaddik that he doesn't care about the reward, maybe after all he's Eliyahu Anavi. The answer to this question we will get when Eliyahu Anavi would come. <coughs> he will say if this guy was really tzaddik or he was just a fool that wasn't thinking a little bit further than what he's supposed to. What do you think, Rabbi? Is it tzaddik or a fool? <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard question, no? For sure he meant it. If I'm offering him to invest in a most profitable cause, it's already in his hands. Yeshiva and CDs. What? And he tells me, as far as I'm concerned, find a poor person on the street, eat kosher, keep Shabbat, doesn't care, give him money. Don't care. Shul, give it to Shul. Anything. If someone wants to get married, give him to for the marriage. Someone is sick, needs medicine, give him for medicine. I don't care. Whatever the cost that comes on the moment. He doesn't know the priorities. Priority. He doesn't know the priorities, but I explain to him the priorities. As, as his spiritual stockbroker, I told him CDs is the highest profit. You invest in CDs, you make yourself valet tshuva, they feed your account for eternity. You, your children, your grandchildren enjoy forever from it. It's the best investment. And Torah, I gave him the top two, top two. What does he tell me? I don't care about the reward. You give it, you put it anywhere you want. I wonder what the public think about this question. It's not an easy question, believe me, because it's very hard to know how Hashem looks at him. Does he look at him and say, wow, what a great guy. He's completely not selfish, doesn't care about himself. Or Hashem say, why did I give you a brain, Mr. X? <laughs> to use it, not to be a fool. Why did I make priorities in charity? Why? Because I want people to go for the top priority, not for the lowest priority. That's why there are priorities. Otherwise, I would make a rule in the Torah, every mitzvah is equal. Doesn't matter. Anything you did, very good. Ahmad the terrorist is hungry, give him food, mitzvah, no problem. Just like you fed Rav Yashiv. Same thing, don't worry. Everything is mitzvah. That's not what Hashem said. Some mitzvot are actually very big sins. If you give someone that will use your money on Shabbat to put gas in his car, you didn't do mitzvah, you made a sin. You made a sin. If you give money for a person and, you, and he's telling you that he's taking the money and going to buy non-kosher food to eat. You didn't make cigarettes also. If, some, if a heroin addict comes to you and bang on your windshield, excuse me, excuse me, I need my injection right away. Kadima, give me 50 bucks. No problem, senor. Here, 50 bucks. You made a mitzvah? No. Some people do think they did. Poor guy, look, he's suffering. Better he suffer now for a week or two and get out of it. What's the point of continuing to destroy him? Tani Dibur, for sure, because Tani Dibur doesn't, doesn't kill you physically. When you don't speak, all day sit and learn and you don't speak, it's better than to fast. 
Next question. Is it true that when you eat food from broken plates, does it make you forgetting things? Does it affect your memory or no? The answer, only Kafa Chaim said so. No one agreed. So when you have one opinion out of thousands of people, nobody ever backed it up, you don't really have what to worry about. But if you see that you have a lot of sources for it, solid sources, then obviously it's something to be worried about. Kafa Chaim Siman Bet. That's only Kafa Chaim. That if you eat from broken plates, it may affect your memory. Do we have an obligation to buy organic food since they claim that it's healthier and the Torah is always to keep the health of the body? Therefore, if that's proven that it's healthier, it may become an obligation that no one is allowed to eat processed food, only organic. It's very good business and gimmick, for sure. But the question is, assuming that it was really healthier, assuming, uh, I mean, if we knew for sure, is it become an obligation or no? no. The answer, 200 researches were made to prove that organic food is healthier than non-organic. And they could not provide one proof that it's more healthy. Not even one proof. A lot of fairy tales, like my scientist in a debate. <laughs> Lots of stories. I told him, show one source, one proof, and the, the debate is over. Until today, it's continuing. <laughs> no, no, where is the source? Give a name, give a proof. Proof, not stories. Stories you have unlimited in this world. No proof. So the answer is not, it was not proven. Even if everyone claimed that it's better, it's all a gimmick. Now, someone wants to debate this answer I just gave you. He claimed in previous generation, people were healthier. They lived longer. The answer, not true. Today, we live much longer than 100 years ago, when everyone ate organic. Today, we eat all the garbage you can think on Earth. Yellow, red, yellow six, all these chemicals, preservatives. Average age in Israel for men, 82 years old. What was it 30, 40 years ago? 70 something. The life became six, seven years longer for the men, and I don't remember by the women. Which means we live longer now. Why? Because of the medication. Medication. Yeah, could be medication. Could be. But even, but you know how many people are fighting against medication because it's chemical? Do you know how many parents do not want to vaccine their kids? It's, it's a different story. But next debate, I will bring the, the research and definitely the information that organic is You know, this book, before it was printed, they already checked 200 major researchers and they couldn't find one. What incentive they have to write against organic food? What the, the rabbi here cares if people eat organic food? He doesn't care. It's not his competition that has organic food. Yeah, it, it depends on the you know, certification, obviously. Not everything that you, you can trust, not everything is, is claiming to be organic. Is organic. That's besides the point. My question to you, do you know a solid proof? You know what solid proof? That no one can argue with that that someone has in this world, can you name a source? I don't have it on me, but I will have it next to you. And here I am, that I don't have that much knowledge about this, and I promise you that there is no solid source. Maybe there is all kinds of claims, maybe they have logical claims, but I want you to encourage you only one thing. Before you finding me whatever you find, Please first learn what does it mean a proof, because 99.9% .9 of the people in the world does not understand what does it mean proof. They, it means convincing evidence, it's not proof. Convincing stories, people are saying, almost everyone believe in it. Survey show that 80% of the people think that organic food is healthier. That's not a proof. 
<laughs> proof means two plus two is four. Do you know anyone can debate that? No one. The argument is over for eternity. That's what it means, proof. Is there a way to prove that organic food, if you, I, I, I kind of know what you're going to show me. You're going to show me a research that 100 people ate for three months organic people, and in another group, 100 people did not eat organic, and in the group that people ate organic, they reported less diseases. That's not a proof. That's probability. Maybe higher probability. Maybe suggesting evidence, but it's not a proof. No. Proof. Proof means no argument. I understand, but you also have to consider differentiation uh, factors. The, the air we breathe in. Um, the atmosphere that you know we surround the by, the negative thoughts that we have, uh, negativity in general. I mean, everything. These everything you say, you're correct. Healthy. Everything you say, you're correct. But the but but still, we have an interesting point. You're right. There's a lot more smoke that we breathe today because uh, 50 years ago we didn't have that much smoke, or 100 years ago. And the cellular phones, and there's all kinds of radiations, and there's chemical medicine, and the food is processed, and there's preservatives, and there's all kinds of things. And still, with all these threats, the life is longer than what it used to be. So it's very hard. I mean, technically, life should have been 30 years, that's it, with all these threats to the life. However, maybe that's an explanation why there is so much cancer today. Overall, people live longer, but overall, cancer went thousands of percent higher in the last 10, 20 years. It's keep growing like crazy. It's becoming an epidemic. If cancer continue to grow the way it is, we are not far from the day that almost everyone will have it, if it continue to grow, which means at one point, the world will come to an end that if one out of a thousand people will not have it, everyone will look at him like he's a UFO. <coughs> how come you don't have it? That's, how, that's where we're heading to unless if we come up with a cure. Nobody knows what causes cancer, by the way. They're trying. Some research say cellular phone contributing to cancer. Some say absolutely not. Some say eggs are healthy. Some research say e eggs are very unhealthy. Some research say garlic is very healthy. Some say not healthy. It's causing damage. Almost in everything, you have contra contradictions. That's why I cannot call it a proof. <laughs> proof means it left no, no argument after it was presented. No one can make any argument against it. I'll give you an example. Albert Einstein, when he published his research, seven years, no scientists in the world agree to endorse it, not even one. Seven years, everyone checked his record. They came to the same results, and they still threw it to the garbage. It's impossible. It cannot be all these years we lived in a lie. It's called in psychology, psychology it's called cog cognitive dissonance. That the heart and the brain does not work in the same speed. What the brain understands in a minute or in an hour may take years for the heart to agree with, which means you still follow your regular instinct. It's very hard to change based on new results. If somebody just show you that the business that you appreciate so much and you think that you have such a great business is actually losing money, it will take you a long time to make the necessary adjustment. Why? Because in your mind, it cannot be that 20 years you live in a lie and you think you're making millions. In reality, you're only making thousands. It's very difficult. Same thing over here. All scientists, they didn't have a word to contradict Einstein. Seven years until one came and said, hey, how long will ignore his research? Do we have anything to go against it? No. Every one of us checked it, and it came out perfect. So what's the problem? And then eventually the world agreed. In the mind, it was one day. In reality, it took seven years. And that's what happened also when it comes to religion. To prove the Torah is divine, it takes me maximum 20 minutes if the person is a little bit clever. Maximum 20 minutes. No answer. They cannot answer. Not one person ever gave me an answer in 20 years. There's no answers against the Torah. Same thing Christians don't have one answer to the mistakes and the contradictions in their books that prove that it's not divine. Or Muslim. 
They, they cannot prove, because you can see right away that their books were not given by God. They're full of human errors in the lowest level. By Torah, you have so much evidence that only the creator of the world was able to write such a book. You show it to the secular people, they ignore what you show. They answer something else. It cannot be. They give you, I'll give you an example. There was one woman who could go back and forth with me already 50 emails. So first, the opening statement that she had that the Tanakh is fairy tale. It's just stories. And what was her best proof against the Torah? A quote from the Tanakh. I promise you, I'm not lying. That's what she did. She took a part from the Tanakh, from, you know, and Melachim. She sent it to me, and she said, how come over here and here and here? That's a sign that the Torah is not divine. So she's using the Tanakh to try to disprove the Torah, but after she gave a whole speech that the Tanakh is fairy tale. Why? She can't digest in her mind that she really have nothing against the Torah. Only stories and nonsense. Not one evidence against they don't have. Besides the point that almost none of them ever read the Torah. As you can see, I asked this scholar, this uh, skeptic, if he read the Torah from A to Z, and he understand all the meanings of the words, and he admitted that not. But still, he comes to debate against the Torah. <laughs> if somebody wants to debate me about Shakespeare, he's an expert in Shakespeare, all his life teaching university Shakespeare, and I read it maybe half briefly, because it was very boring to me. So, you know, in school they force you. So, barely I read it just that my teacher won't throw me out of the class. Will I dare to come on a debate against a specialist in Shakespeare when I don't have 2% knowledge in Shakespeare? And I know he has 100% knowledge. I'm only going to make myself look like a fool. Same thing in computers. Same thing in physics. Same thing in medicine. I will not make myself a fool. But when it comes to Torah, everyone is a fool. Everyone is a clown. No one cares about his reputation. Everyone comes and scream and bark against the Torah when everyone knows he doesn't have 1% knowledge of the Torah. This is an amazing phenomena here. People give speeches against the Torah, and when you connect them to a lie detector, you see they never read the Torah. They don't, it's, it's, it's really crazy. It doesn't make any, not even a drop of a sense. All right, time is running out. Let's finish at least this chapter. I said, where shall I go? So back to what we asked. So if we, we did prove oh, that uh, uh, the food is bad, are we, are we supposed to eat it now? Assuming that it's bad, this food or any other food, if it will be proven that organic food helps the health of a person and prevent problems, it definitely becomes an obligation. Regardless of price, let's say? Regardless of price. Do you know how much one surgery costs in America? Well, a person making 30 years of hard work, one surgery. Do you know how much a night in a hospital costs here? Do you know how much antibiotic costs me, 10 pills? 400 and something dollars, wow. 10 pills, antibiotic. Yes, yes, that's what's going on in this world. In the long run, if you have to spend 20% more on food to keep you healthier and function better and to be less tired and less fatigued, it's worth the investment. But like I said, it's never been proven, so let's move on. If I see bread on the floor when I walk in the street, do I have an obligation to pick it up and put it in a corner? Yes. yes. The answer, there's no obligation. If it's dirty already, became black, dirty, and it's not deserved to be eaten, no obligation to pick it up. It's not considered bread anymore. But if it's completely brand new, just fell from someone's bag a minute ago. Then you have an obligation to pick it up and put it somewhere. But once people walked over it, or mud, or snow, or rain, uh, you know how it is. It becomes very quickly, very quickly, it becomes dirty, doesn't have 
a status of a bread anymore. That's the answer of Rav Eliashiv. Kavenaki siman nunchet. Is it recommended to drink in the middle of the meal or only before or after? Rambam says not to drink in the meal. It says wait 20 minutes. Today, doctors claim that it's good to drink before you begin to eat. It's making the me'ayim, how do you say me'ayim? Digestion system, it makes it more smooth <coughs> and able to function better. The enzyme, okay. <laughs> When we say pat shacharit, mitzvah to eat pat shacharit, that saves us from 84 sicknesses, to eat bread in the morning. Does it have to be bread only, or it can be all kinds of five grains, cookies, wafers, corazon? <laughs> Some says it can be all kind of food, even chocolate. Even vegetables and fruits. <coughs> it doesn't have to be really bread. In the Torah, when the Torah says, lachem, means they had a meal. It could be rice and meat. Lechem in modern Hebrew and also ancient Hebrew, it means bread. But when the Torah says, lechem, not necessarily they have to eat bread. It can be a meal, sitting to eat a meal. However, the opinion that it's more accepted, that it has to be anything that made from five kinds of grains. Cookies, cakes, also good. Mezonot, something mezonot, that's called pat shachrit. Only after tefillat shachrit. Only after tefillat shachrit. Someone once told me, uh, like it's allowed to eat um, before Tfilah to get caught. And then, I, and then I ask another rabbi who's not... Only rabbi. for sick people and old people. People that are sick or very old, it's hard for them to start the day without eating something. They can't function because they're naturally weak. Then they have permission to eat that they can pray better. But normal, regular young people, what do they need to eat before they pray? They can't stay one hour? Especially today when the minhag is that people have their coffee in the morning. The coffee has some kind of energy, especially with the sugar. If I'm eating delicious food to enjoy the greatness of God, the great things he created, I want to eat from here, and I want to try from here, and I try this, and I try Indian food, and Pakistani food, and kosher, of course. Because I want to learn more things about Hashem, spices, ginger, this, yellow powder, all kinds of things in the world. Is that considered achila l'shem shamayim or no? For the sake of heaven or not? Out of admiration to Hashem? Well, if you ask a chassid, for sure, yes, ma, Shabbos, without good shulen, gefilte fish, all kinds of things, ha. Huh? And Machia, the Moroccan, with that Arak and Shabbat, how can it be? We're not talking Shabbat now. We're talking now every day. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, let me taste from here. You know, in a wedding, what did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> That's called eating for the sake of your stomach, not for the sake of heaven. Ay, 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 ay. Are we allowed to eat sandwich on the street? No. The answer, it's like a dog eating on the street. What about ice cream? Also not allowed. What about drinking my coffee when I'm walking on the street? Or water? Allowed or not allowed? Yes. It's a eating is forbidden, not drinking. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. But in Israel, they... Isn't the ice cream a temporary... 
<laughs> Some say it's included in eating, drinking. Also not allowed to drink on the street. So it's disagreement about it. <coughs> in a supermarket, when I put things in my cart, but I didn't pay in the register yet, but I'm going to pay, it's on, I'm on my way there. Am I allowed to open and snack a little bit? Since I'm anyway going to pay, or only it becomes mine after I pay? What's the rule? Huh? Let me ask you a question. When officially the wafers you just put in your shopping cart become yours? When you put in a car? In a cart? I, I, I'll give you all the options. Maybe Mashiach would come before this shul will replace this annoying standard. <laughs> torture this. Anyway, I'll give you all the options. One, as soon as you picked it up from the shelf, you picked it up, it's yours. Second option, only when you left it from your hand in your cart, it became yours. Third option, only when you paid for it, after they received the money, that second it became yours. Fourth option, even after you paid is not yours, only when you came out of the territory, territory of the store, it became yours. Which one of the four? Huh? So according to you, if I pick up a gel to, to see what's, what's the ingredients, it's mine already. No, no, just looking at that. I tell you why it's important to know. Because what happened, what happened if Loa Lenu, there's a terrorist attack now in the middle? And, and things are falling and breaking. And then after the Arab ran away, the owner of the store come and say, look what happened, all your things broke. He said, what? what do you want from me? It's not mine, it's yours. You have to pay for it. He said, no, 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 you put it in your cart, it fell from your cart because there was a here, mess. You have to pay. I was right. But he didn't leave your store. I didn't get to get it. He said, it doesn't matter, you put it in your cart, it's yours already. The damage was done to you. If he breaks your watch, also you tell me to pay because it was in my supermarket, the attack. It's yours already. Pay for it. They may not make you pay. It's courtesy, but you're obligated to pay by law of the Torah. The law of the Torah. They say no. They say no. Uh, you can owe me ten dollars, and I tell you I don't want it. Forget it. Doesn't mean you don't owe me. And the minute I told you you don't have to pay, it's fine. You don't owe me anymore. But it doesn't mean the law changed. It still owed me before I gave it up. So the same thing over here. The owner of the supermarket wants to keep you as a client. He doesn't want to be too stingy. So don't worry about it. Yes. Especially, usually, it's manager. It doesn't come out of his pocket. You know? He doesn't feel the pain. So the answer is, <laughs> the answer is, I'm not allowed to eat before I pay for it. Second, it looks suspicious in the eyes of people. Maybe you walk around the supermarket, eat, 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 and then you put it in one shelf. <laughs> there are people who does it. There are people who does it. Every time you go shopping, you see something open somewhere. People do it, unfortunately. Uh, people with no iracha mind, they do it. Also, it's considered eating in a shuk, in a market, which is also not allowed to eat in public. What about the park? If you eat in a park, it's also considered eating on the street, or since it's a place that people go in order for them to eat there, it's considered okay. It's okay. It's in a park, it's allowed. Now, the answer, when the product become yours, after you paid, it's still not yours. From the minute they got the money, when you picked it up, then it became yours. But you have to do a Kenyan. Kenyan, that's it. In other words, you give the money, she puts it in the register, and the things are right there. It's, not, it's still not by you. Once you picked it up, 
or you went into your cart after you paid, which means from the register towards the street, towards the store, it's still not yours. You paid, you picked it up, and you moved away, it became yours. Now if there's robbery and something happened, that's your problem right now. Yeah. Well, but in the shoot in Israel, everybody is so traumatic. Many people also mechalel Shabbat in Israel. Doesn't make it allowed. Not allowed. The owner allows you to do it. But I go into the store, he knows that he allows you to taste the grapes because he knows that... No, to taste is something else. Uh -huh. To taste is good for business. He knows when you taste one or two, it's like the drug dealers. In the first few times, they give for free. It's not one. Once they get the kid addicted, they know it's going to bring them a lot of money. Not because they're very generous. You know, people who go to murder kids, usually they're not so generous. It's only calculation. It's good for business. All these companies who send samples, all these places in Costco, they cut to you all this thing. What, they bet tamchui? They open Bet Tamchui for the poor people. Why they give those cheeses on crackers? Why? They know it's good for me. Worth it for them. Before we finish, what bracha Bnei Israel made on a man who fell every day from heaven? Hamotzi lechem min ha-shamayim. Hamotzi lechem min ha-aretz, that takes bread out of the land. That's five kinds of grains. Hamotzi lechem... Hashem gave the lechem min ha-shamayim. I want to get a job in a supermarket to walk on a stand, just like they have in Costco, that people taste. That's my job. I cut cheese, put it on crackers, and give it to people. However, this is a question by an Israeli person. However, most of the clients don't make bracha when they eat. What am I going to start? Saying, hey, hey, make a bracha. They kick me out of the job 10 minutes after I <laughs> were hired. Am I allowed or a religious guy cannot have this job? Huh? The answer, better not to get this job. That if that's the only job you have, it's allowed. Why? Maybe he will say bracha. Maybe he will. There's always a chance that he will. Second, second, some say that if you only taste, the first bite to taste, you don't have to make bracha. How do you know? Maybe you don't like it. If they give you something that tastes like poison for you, what are you going to make bracha for? You make bracha for pleasure. There's no pleasure. It's punishment. That's why you don't make bracha for eating pills unless if they have good taste. If it's sucking uh, medicine, it has flavor, then you make bracha. Same thing vitamins. <clears throat> if they have flavor, it has to be kosher. If they don't have flavor, they taste like chemical, they don't have to be kosher. You understand the idea here? Only if there's pleasure from it. Now, <clears throat> my father does not make brachot, and he asked me to make him a meal. Doesn't wash his hand, eat bread without netila, etc. Am I allowed to serve him with the food or no? By now, there's no chance he's going to make bracha. Not like in a supermarket. You don't know who this client is. Some chilonim, they go like this. They make bracha, because they're already becoming balei tshuva, but they're embarrassed to walk with a kippah. So if he walks without kippah, doesn't mean he doesn't make bracha. Many people here in Flatbush, they don't walk with kippah, but they shomer Shabbat and eat kasher and make brachot. They go to the restaurant, they take this light yamaka from their pocket, put it and they do Birkat Amazon. So therefore, just because he walks, he looks like a guy on the street, doesn't mean he's a real guy. He could be a religious person. You know? Religious person who is embarrassed to look religion, religious. However, there's a chance that he will make bracha. But his father, he knows his father doesn't make bracha. There's no hocus pocus over here now. Is he allowed to make him the meal or no? Eat with him and be moist. Eat with him and be moist. All the time. The answer, not allowed. Not allowed. When you say no, Kibbutz Avayim is over Kibbutz Avayim, it's only apply when it doesn't go against Hashem. 
If your father asks you to kill someone for him, you want to respect him, but you're not allowed to kill. The rabbi gave a good offer that whenever he asks you to eat, you sit to eat with him at least one bite. You make the bracha and he said, here, just answer amen. Why he eats without netila? It's a problem, but the actual food, at least he made bracha. He eats without netila, he has a separate side problem. But the actual food, I'm giving you the food to eat. I heard an opinion of the Chazonish that he said that if you, do, if you don't serve a stranger, if he wants to come to you to eat and you don't want to give him food because you know he's not going to make bracha, it will cause tension and hatred. Because of that, you're allowed. But we are now talking about your father. That's why we say father, not stranger. Stranger came, two people came, one with yamaka, one without. So you say, well, you sit over here. I cannot give you food. You come, you eat. Well, give me something. No, no, no. You don't, you don't eat kosher. You don't make brachot. You, forget it. You cannot eat by me. What do you think is going to think about you and your religion? So therefore, since there is uh, two mitzvot that collides with each other, Sometimes it's a problem. You have to do which one is not as bad. Which one of the two would be worse? The same question exists by shaking hands to women. Man is in his work and a woman wants to shake his hand, not for romance, for hello. That's the way to say hi, nice to meet you, come in. Even the detective who are about to put you 20 years in prison, when you come to the investigation, they shake your hands. It's not out of love, believe me. So many people, they have this dilemma, what to do? To say, no, no, what's going to be if he shakes? Fine, I don't care about this handshake. Shank, goodbye, move on. Some people say, oh, but still, you touched her, it's not allowed. The best solution is, chacham enaf berosho. When I go to places like this, I make sure in one hand I have my bag, the other ones I have few books. When they come, they know they cannot shake my hands because my hands are occupied. I go like this, hello everyone, hi. And I see it here, no handshake. That's better. If you got stuck, surprised, you put the books a minute, and all of a sudden it goes like this. <laughs> you have to say, I'm sorry, for religion reasons, it's against the law of my religion to shake hands with women, or women should say with men, that's all. Nobody ever got offended. Once you say it's for religion reasons, you know, it's not personal. Then I'll say that I know someone from your religion that did shake hands. Ah, then you say he violated the rule. There are also other people in my religion who make bigger violations than that, unfortunately. That's it. And you know what? It could be sensitive if it's minorities that have, you know, already feel that people maybe don't like them enough. If you don't shake their hands, they may think, oh, you're racist, you don't want to shake my hand. That's why I have to declare that it's nothing personal. It has to be as a matter of religion. That's it. You can only shake hands with ugly women. You can only shake hands with ugly women. Someone's relatives who are atheists and they come for a meal. Now, uh, the religious family could ask them to, to make, make the bracha. And sure. When they go to the Arabs and they take them, take your shoes off. Or if you come to the house of a Korean guy and he asks you, please take your shoes off before you come in, do you make a demonstration against him? No problem, Mr. Chang. <laughs> no problem, of course. Take your shoes off. But when you come to a religious Jew and he asks you to make, say a few words when you sit and eat with him, uh. five hours speech and fight until somebody pull a knife. Why? Yetzerara, the evil inclination, doesn't care that you take your shoes off when you walk to this idol worshiper house. He's happy. It makes him even feel great. The, the Chiloni, the secular Jew, when he walks into a mosque, and they ask him to take the shoes off. Do you know how great he feels? Mm. Wow, I'm such a decent person. I respect others. I'm open-minded. 
But tomorrow when he comes to the shul and you take him, please put yamaka on. Ma? I don't believe in this. No. I also saw one rabbi, same rabbi I told you that kicked the women that forgot to dress, kicked them out of the shul. <laughs> one guy came to the same bar mit, uh, wedding and he refused to put the kippah on in the shul. I told him, sir, over here, even George Bush put kippah when he comes in. When Obama went to the hotel, he put kippah on. Over here, you have to put kippah. He doesn't want, you kick him out. There's no politically correct nonsense here. There's the rules here. You want to respect the rules? Come in. You want to rebel against the rules? You are not welcome here. Goodbye. Even if he offer you a $10 million donation, kick him out. He has to respect the place. This is, for us, this is a place of prayers. We are coming here. We serve our God. We pray. We, this is the holy place for us. You don't respect the place. You're not welcome here. Goodbye. Same thing in any other religion. If that's what they believe, you come there, you're going to rebel against them in their own living room. It's chutzpah. What is this? You want to tell them that they're wrong? Tell it to them from outside. Send them a letter. Make a debate with them. Write books against them. Show them the truth. But you don't come into their living room and start waving your flag like the gays do in Mea Sharim in Yerushalayim. They have to come all the way to the holiest city in the world to waive their psycho habits. Do it in Tel Aviv. Why you came all the way here to disturb everyone? Why you want the holy kids to see your field? Why? Why you have to? Why? Because they want to do it on purpose. Why? Because they have Yetzirah. Evil inclination is killing the wicked people from inside. That's it. That's the only thing. There's no evil inclination to walk into a mask without shoes. Because the uh, Satan is very happy he went into a mask right now. <laughs> There's no evil inclination to come into an idol worshiper house and take your shoes off. Why? The Satan is very happy. Well, when you walk into a shul, the Satan gets nervous. Right the way, the resistance in your heart is raising against the religion. Because that's the only truth in the world. Everything else is nonsense. Satan is not, it's not, it's no problem. That's why secular boyfriend and girlfriend, before they get married, they have such beautiful relationship, peace and harmony, even if they don't belong to each other. They don't see the negative. The Satan is blinding them. It's called Maim Gnuvim Imtaku. Stolen water are sweeter than legit water. As soon as they get married, the Satan opens the screen and the truth comes out. We had a couple seven years living together in the same apartment. My husband and wife, 100%. They got married, three months later they got divorced. <laughs> they asked them in a divorce, what's the reason of the divorce? The woman say, he stink, he doesn't take shower, he doesn't brush his teeth, he eats all kinds of smelly food. He has pimples, but seven years she lived with him. He never bothered her, because it was a beautiful scene for the Satan. Satan is very happy. Every time they're together, he's so karet. The Satan is dancing, Ava Nagila. <laughs> so he made harmony between them. Very good. Wow, it's, it served my purpose. I helped them out to make scenes. Soon as it became kosher, I'm going to help you for peace and harmony. Now it became mitzvah. The Satan right away goes to the other side. What do you think? This is how it works. You don't believe me there's Yetzirah? They made a research. They took men that goes to clubs and bars. And they, had, they put identical twins. Two women look exactly the same. Even their mother will not know who is who. That's how it, same thing, same clothes, same perfume, same heels, like the twins, one the Empire State, one the Twin Towers. Everything equals. And they go like this, Itzik, one married, one single. Almost all of them reported in a questionnaire later that they felt a much stronger attraction to the married one. Why? One is legit, one is not. Maim Gnuvim, it's forbidden. The pleasure of doing something forbidden, that comes from the Satan, from the Yetzirah. It's already been proven. This is something that's been proven. Everyone, almost everyone reports that. Yeah, but it's also when you 
Exactly. That's what it calls evil inclination. That's the evil inclination. Because not only that, even when a person doesn't want it, he doesn't even want it. He goes after it because he can't have it. That's it. That's the way it is. When I want to eat snow in a hot day, <laughs> you're supposed to say, how can it be snow in a hot day? In Israel, everything possible. You drive from Tel Aviv in an 80, 90 degrees, you go all the way to the Hermon, oh, snow, two hours right. Snow, you want to eat now. What bracha you made? <laughs> the answer, first bracha, she'akol. What's last bracha? <laughs> last bracha, which one? No bracha achrona. When you drink tea and coffee, no bracha achrona. You eat ice cream little by little, no bracha achrona. Some Ashkenazim, they wait with the tea, they leave enough to be cold, and then they drink it in one shot, and they say bracha achrona, bore nefashot. Why? Because of the doubt. Sfaradim don't hold by it, because they say it doesn't go by what you did. It goes by the way of the world. It's not an individual thing. The rules, the rules apply to the way of the world. People do not drink tea in one shot, or coffee, or swallow the entire ice cream in one shot. That's not the way people eat. So when they eat it little by little, there's no bracha achrona, because you don't ever eat one ounce in four minutes in one shot, which means, you know? <coughs> Next question. What's the right way to say the bracha? Sheakol nihiya bidvaro or sheakol nihiye bidvaro? What's the difference in the meaning? Nihiya means everything was created in the word of God, in the past. Nihiye means everything is being created in the word of God. Which one of the two is more correct? The answer equal. It's, it's Thai. They're both correct. Everything was created from the word of Hashem until now. The other version is everything is being created constantly. Everyone follow the culture of his fathers. What bracha we made on popcorn? Popcorn come from where? Corn. Corn grow where? On the ground. What's grown on the ground, what bracha it is? Adama. However, we have a rule. Something that changes shape is nature completely. Doesn't look anything to remind what it used to be. What his bracha becomes? Sheakol. However, it's, a, it's an argument. Some rabbis say you have to say sheakol on popcorn. Some say adama. Why? Because after all, when you flip it to the other side, you still see the corn. It did not change completely. So that's a matter of argument about reality. Is this considered changed completely or not? It's a matter of opinion. One way or the other, if you don't know the blessing, you can always say sheakol, and it's count. What bracha you make on chocolate? Chocolate, sheakol. But some say bore pri because it's cocoa. It's cocoa beans. But some say no, it gets mixed with all kinds of other things. It's not pure cocoa. The right bracha, sheakol niya bidvaro. What bracha you make on Pringles? Pringles. Pringle chips. Some people think, bore pri adama, like potato chips. The answer, she'akol. Why? It's powder. It first was grinded, then from the powder they made those chips. It's not original sliced potatoes. Sliced potatoes, adama. Pringles, she'akol. What bracha you make on crembo? How do you say crembo in English? Crembo? 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 In English? Oh, wow. Ah. Crembo in Hebrew means creme, cream. Bo means in it. Because it had a biscuit that holds it. Do you make mezonot or you make shakol on a cream? 
Here is the rule. When the mezonot comes to hold it, like ice cream that has the cones, why do you eat the ice cream? For the ice cream or for the cones that hold it? For the ice cream. The cones only came to make it convenient. That's why you make share call on the ice cream, even though you eat with it the corn. But the corn came to hold. However, if the mezonot came not only to hold, it came to give flavor. It's actually a part of the, the, of the delicious flavor of this candy or food, whatever it is. <laughs> then it becomes mezonot, because mezonot is more important. You have to say mezonot. So therefore, the crembo, some people only buy the crembo for the actual cookie. Well, it's, it's very common in Israel. They take it out and they give the cream to someone else. Some, the other way around. So it depends. If you bought it for the, for, the, for the cookie, you make mezonot. If you bought it for the actual cream, this is only came to hold. Then you make shakol. That's the rule. What bracha you make on meatballs that have flowers in it? The flower came and it sticks the meat together. Do you make shakol or you make mezonot? Everything that comes to put things together or to make it stand, it's become secondary. It's not the primary things in the food. It's like glue. It's not actually, you don't use it actually as the actual food. Nobody eats meatballs for the flour there. So that's, it's like it doesn't exist. It's charcoal. However, if it comes to give flavor, like in chicken cutlets, they have all these breadcrumbs that with flavors that actually gives all the flavor. Then it becomes mezonot. Because without it, it tastes nothing. It tastes like a piece of chicken with no flavor. That actually gives all the flavor. That gives all the pleasure. And the blessing is for the pleasure, for the, for the taste, that you enjoy the food. That's what it means for. Uh, no, but we have to make one bracha. You don't start breaking the food to ingredients and make five brachot for every food you eat. Schnitzel mezonot if it has breadcrumbs. If it only has eggs, some people just dip it in eggs and flour. But it, it doesn't, well, maybe over there with flour also mezonot, could be. But if it's only eggs, then it's for sure shakol. What about sushi? Sushi mezonot. Someone who just ate and right away vomit everything. He did not digest it yet. Does he make a bracha or no? Birkat Amazon. Just ate a sandwich. Two minutes later, you vomit everything. It didn't even digest it in your stomach. It takes time. Do you have to make Birkat Amazon or no? Huh? The answer, no. Only when food started to digest, then when you have. But how do you know? You're not hungry anymore. How do you know if the food started to digest? When the hunger goes away, now you know some of the food started to get digested. Three women that eat together, can they do zimun? The answer, they can, but it's not the custom. Usually women don't do this. Unless they have yamaka. When Gilad Shalit the Israeli soldier that was five years in the prison of the Hamas was released. Was it proper to say Barakat Shecheyanu or it's actually a tragedy the day he was released? There are two sides. Some say you don't save one Jew by killing hundred. The people that were released on the Gilad Shalit already killed more than 11 Israelis. So we already paid for sure by 11 lives after he's released. Some people say it's against the Torah to release him. Because we know that these thousand murderers are waiting for the opportunity to put their hands on more Jews and kill them. Who are you releasing? The biggest monsters in history. Monsters, real monsters. This is not human being. 
you release 1,000 murderers and expect them not to kill at least one Jew? For sure, they will. It's a certain thing. So what is the great deal about it? Saving the life of one Jew from prison in order for, for them to kill many others? And what about if they didn't kill, but everyone lives in fear around them? It's also something to consider. So the question is, was it something proper in the moment to say Shecheyanu, or since we know the consequences, it's actually a sad day? Good question. Hard one. With lots of emotion. And when it's always with emotion, people begin to bark from all over. No, what do you think? No. The answer, not to say Sheikh Yanu. Someone that met his friend after a few years, he did not see him. And he's very happy about that meeting. Saw him on the street. Oh, what bracha should he make? Shecheyanu or Baruch Mechaya Amitim? The answer is, if he did not hear from him or see him for at least one year, then he makes Baruch Mechaya Amitim. But if he only did not see him, but he spoke to him on the phone, but now after a year, if they finally meet, then he makes Shecheyanu. Shecheyanu, after a year, not 30 days. Someone who swimmed in the ocean and started to drown. And in the last minute, somebody swam to him and saved his life. Does he have to make Birkat Gomel or no? Yes. What do you think? Because based on the rules, who makes Birkat Gomel? Someone went to the hospital, right? You're the, um, huh? You're the, Someone who crossed the ocean. Hi. The question about the airplane, if it applies or not. Someone that was in jail and was released. But it didn't say that someone that was in a life risk and got saved, he has to make Birkat Gomel. But we, reality-wise, we see that people that got saved from a horrible tragedy, they do say Birkat Gomel. Right. Maybe it's Bracha Levatala. The intention is good. He comes to thank Hashem in public. But the question is, is it legit to make Bracha like this or not? Huh? <laughs> The best thing for someone like that, in shul almost every Shabbat there's at least one person who makes Birkat Gomel. So he has to say to him, when you make the bracha, have me in mind. Be motzi me. Which you don't have to say the bracha. It's enough, you just answer amen. It counts like you say the bracha. And in case it's bracha is not necessary, you did not mention the name of Hashem in vain. So like this, it's perfect from all direction. But someone like that, also have to do tshuva for two reasons. First reason, you all know that Hashem sent him a message that you really deserve to die if you almost died. You better do tshuva, okay. But there's another, one more reason that he have to do tshuva, what? That he went to swim in a beach when there is no lifeguard. It's life risk. You may come and say, I know how to swim. What do I need lifeguard? People drown not because they don't know how to swim. If they don't know how to swim, they go to the shallow water. There's no risk for them. They're afraid to come near the deep. Who usually the, the drown in the ocean? Don't Only people who know how to swim. <laughs> but all of a sudden, there's turbulence. And you know, all of a sudden, the water is just changing in a way the water flowing. It pulls them out. Yeah, and it pulls them out, and they can't resist. The, 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 so that's why you need a lifeguard, because every once in a while, between playing backgammon and cards with his friends, <laughs> he's looking. In my own eyes, I've seen in Israel how the lifeguards taking people and saving their life and giving them 
air and oxygen and actually water were coming out and they saved their life. Not once and not twice. Therefore, we have to be very careful not to go to a place that there's no lifeguard. When people say to each other, Ad mea ve'esrim, you should live until 120. <coughs> Is that blessing has a source in Judaism or someone made it up and everyone, like a cattle, follow him? <laughs> the answer, there is no source for it. No source for it. However, there is a verse in Bereshit 6, verse 3. Vayu yamav mea ve'esrim shana. The Torah complements. Vayu yamav 120 years. The Chizkuni say this is the edge of life. This is the border between life and the next world. So maybe that's the source that people started to use. Can people live today longer than 120? Yes. I allow you to curse me like this every day. <laughs> Hopefully your curse will come through. <laughs> if you come to a person and say live to 120, I don't think there's one in the world that would hold it as a curse. But you're right. I actually put a limitation. But this limitation is one to a billion, which is fine. First of all, who's to say that it's good to live such long life if you're very old and sick and suffer and full of pain? Some sick people, they're already dying to die. <laughs> dying to die. <laughs> they don't want to live anymore, but they, don't, they can't commit suicide because it's against the Torah. So they read all day Tehillim, Shir la ma'alo, take me already. When will you take me already? When someone goes to the Niagara Falls for the first time in his life, what bracha he has to say? Baruch Ose Maase Bereshit. Someone who has katarat, which means is the, when he goes to the bathroom to, to, to make, it's constantly leaking after. When exactly is going to say Asher Yatsar? It's constantly leaking every few minutes. No, it's in, in cataracts on the eye. No, not cataracts. I don't know how to cataracts say it in English. Incontinent. Incontinent. Cataracts on the eye. No, no, I didn't say cataract. I said, in, in, the, the way you spell it in Hebrew, it's kuf te tet resh. Katatar. Katatar. Kateter. Kateter. Kather. Kather. Kather, yes, yes. Kather. When it's constantly leaking, that's the highlight the point that he obviously doesn't stop doing his bathroom almost ever. He needs maybe a diaper or whatever, you know. Someone like that, when does he ever thank Hashem for Asher Yatsar? The answer, Rav Moshe Feinstein answer, no, Ber Moshe, it says, כשמסירים אותו, או מחליפים, או שנופל מעצמו. I guess they put a device there, the doctors, so when they replace it, he has an opportunity to say, or if it falls by itself, they have to say. But as long as it's leaking, no, they don't have to say, because it never finished. My father was saved from Auschwitz. When I go to Auschwitz on a tour, when I go to the place where my father was locked, what bracha do I have to say there? Do I have to say bracha baruch shasa nes le'avi b'makom ze? If a person had a miracle himself in a place, his car flipped over and he came out alive. Every time he passed by this place, he make bracha baruch shasa li nes v'makom ze. Bless you, God, who made a miracle to me in this place. What happened if he did it to your son or to your father? Do you also make bracha? 
bless you for making a miracle for my father or no? Yes. The answer is, if the miracle is above nature, it's not something that can happen once in a while. That it's really, really a rare miracle. Like a plane crash completely, 500 people die, and he's the only survivor. That's above nature. To fall from a plane and not to die, it's a very, very big miracle. It's against the law of nature. But not every little accident that you got saved and you didn't get killed, it's above nature. Because in accidents, 70% may get hurt and 30% get away with that. Happens all the time. Auschwitz, getting out of Auschwitz, is that considered a very rare miracle? Or after all, maybe two or three or five percent of the people did come out of there. I don't know the statistic, I'm asking. So if there were a substantial amount of people who came out of there, even though it's a big miracle, but it's not a completely rare miracle that happens once in a blue moon. But if it's something that was really, really against the law of nature, that one out of a million were able to come out, and obviously, yes. Then he makes a bracha, Baruch Shasanes, Lavi, Bimakom Ze. We're making a great progress towards finishing our series. a blessing in a kitchen when my garbage can is open, doesn't have a lid? If there's no smell, yes. If it smells, you have to stay aware where the smell stops. Why people say, bless you when someone sneezes? In Hebrew, they say, la briut. The answer is, the Chazal told us that Yaakov Avinu prayed to Hashem. This is in the Gemara in Baba Metziah, page uh, 87. They, uh, that people, when before they die, they sneeze, and the soul came out. So Yaakov asked mercy on that from Hashem. So now when people sneeze, they don't die. That's why automatically the reaction is, bless you, stay blessed, stay alive. Is it obligation to say? No, not an obligation. Obligation to keep Shabbat. <laughs> In Hanukkah, what's better, to light candle with olive oil or with actual candles? Olive oil. Both of them are good. For Shabbat, olive oil is better. Hanukkah, both are good. You have this, good. You don't have that, it's also good. When a person is in a hotel or in a hospital and he wants to light candle and it's against the regulation to light candle in a room, what do you do? Electric. Electric. Shabbat. Not Shabbat. It could be Shabbat, it could be Hanukkah. There are special lights, special light, electric lights that people can light. The question is, do they make a blessing on those lights or no? The answer, every time there's a doubt if to make a blessing or not, you don't say the blessing, because the actual blessing doesn't cancel the mitzvah, if you didn't say it. The mitzvah can count even without the bracha. The bracha, it's a bonus that you get. But yeah, so if you have a doubt, you don't say. 
Why? Because it's worse to say, and you didn't need to say, and you mentioned the name of Hashem, than not to say. That's why, same thing if you came out of the bathroom, you don't remember if you make a Sharia Tzar blessing. Did I say it? I didn't say it. You're not allowed to say again. Maybe you did. So better not to say. So you wait until someone else goes into the bathroom. When he comes and washes his hands, say, make, when you make bracha, have me in mind. I'm not sure if I did. Yes, and you answer amen. We almost finished with all this uh, blessing chapter. Woman wants to sing Shalom Aleichem in a table. Everybody sings Shalom, and then all of a sudden she remembers she used to sing in an opera in Austria. <laughs> she starts with her beautiful singing. You know? <laughs> allowed or not allowed? Only if there's no guest. She can sing for her husband until tomorrow. <laughs> no problem. What happens if a person has a CD of a woman without her picture, without name? Someone made a CD and he gave it to him and said, you have to listen to this woman singer, how beautiful she sings. Kosher music. Words from Tehillim, everything. Not, not chas v'shalom, bad, dirty words. But he doesn't know who this woman is and he never saw her image. Is he allowed to listen or no? Yes. The answer, yes. Better not, of course better not. Some things better not to start having thoughts. But if he doesn't have her image in his mind, he doesn't have who to think about. Because automatically when you know how this woman singer look, what's the first thing as soon as you see the CD, you begin to think about her. And usually the way you think about her is not in such a modest way because she's not modest. All these singers, the way they present themselves everywhere. So right away, without even controlling it, first thing comes to your mind is her image on a CD or one time when he saw it in a, in a sign on a street or somewhere. But if he doesn't know who this woman is, all he hears is a beautiful song. He doesn't know who to think about. And you pretend that he... Then it's allowed. Then it's allowed. However, the extra righteous people, they don't listen to this kind of music. Even if they don't know who this woman is, no problem. Help him to open, to, to open up his eyes. <laughs> Someone that has diabetes, how is he going to make Kiddush and Avdala? Single guy, not married or divorced. He's alone now. He has to do Kiddush and Avdala. How is he going to drink the grape juice or the wine? He has diabetes. The answer, he drinks very little dry wine, mix 22 samak. How do I say in English 22 samak? It's the lowest amount. It can be also mixed with water as long as the majority is wine, which means it has to be together one ounce, and then it's, he can do it. Samak is cc. Cc? So 22 cc. 22 cc mixed with the same amount of water, which means 20, 21 cc. And then for, for together, and as long as it's dry, because it doesn't have, I guess, a lot of sugar, dry wine, he still have the obligation to drink. If women don't cover the hair, your guest, they keep Shabbat, they came for Shabbat, they're not driving, but one of the women or two of them, they came with their hair like this, they don't cover their head. Or they put a little yarmulke on their head with a clip. But all the hair is out. Are you allowed to make bracha looking at the hair of a married woman? No. Not allowed. So what do you do? Either you close your eyes or you put your head down. That's, that's what the rabbis in Israel do when they go to be Mesader Kiddushin in a chupa in the weddings of the secular people. Now, over there, it's not that the hair is not covered, nothing is covered. <laughs> so the rabbi goes like this. Where is it? It's the rabbi, it's the bathroom, the rabbi. The chupa, it's over there. Unfortunately, we live in such a generation. Are we allowed to have goyim in a Shabbos table? The neighbor, Vini, has empathy for Jews. Hey, Rabbi, don't forget me. I like this challah of your wife. 
He wants to come. Let's think together. What are the possible problems that may occur by inviting a non-Jewish person to the Shabbat table? One problem, he may touch the wine. So no problem, you get a cooked wine. Mevushal. So you solve that problem. What's the other problem? He begins to talk his nonsense. Did you hear about the championship? Vini threw the ball and Jackson caught it. And it was a great touchdown. He ruins the whole. It doesn't mean bad, but he doesn't know any better from his life. What is he going to talk to you about? Rashi? What Rashi say about the parasha? He may talk about Wall Street. He may talk about sport. He may talk about his new girlfriend, how nice she is to him. One way or the other, it's only going to cause embarrassment to you and to him. So what's the point? Invite him in different occasions. Shabbat, you have to feel the holiness of Shabbat. But it doesn't only apply to goyim. It also applies to Jews. If you have a Jew that you try to be mekarevim, it's one thing. But it's just a friend that there's no way to be mekarevim. It's a complete rasha. But he likes to come to the Shabbat to talk and eat Israeli seeds. You know, it's very common here in America and in Israel. What's the point of inviting him? He ruins the holiness of the whole Shabbat with his nonsense talking. What is he talking about? If it's not Lashon Hara, he talks about the great kick that this player kicked into the net and it's with tears of joy. Or some kind of a drama movie that he watched. Or about his ex-wife. Or about who knows what. What is he going to say next? You sit and shaking the entire night. What's going to come out of his, if his mouth full of jewels? You understand? Ay, 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 ay. The laws of Mukze, all the laws of Mukze in Shabbat, what generation they started? You're not allowed to move this, you're not allowed to touch the sand, you're not allowed to pick up rocks. All these laws of Muqsa and Shabbat. When they started, when? It's a decree. From what generation they started? The answer, Moshe Rabenu. From Moshe Rabenu's time already. Where do we know it from? What's the source? Aruch HaShulchan, Or HaChaim, Shin Chet, Seif Dalet. That's the source right there. Is Sheleg is Mukze on Shabbat? Snow. You want to pick up snow? The answer is not Mukze, but you also have to be careful not to smash it. If it's chunks and you press on it and it becomes water, it's also not good, not allowed. I have a dollar from the Lubavitch Rebbe, or a coin. I have a silver coin that he gave every once in a blue moon. It was, I think, like Baomer 30 years ago, 20, 26 years ago. I went there. He gave me a coin, silver coin, so the, and plus a dollar I have. The question is, is it Mukze on Shabbat or no? I'm, oh, I'm allowed to walk with this for the blessing. <laughs> Is it, uh, Why are we not allowed to use money on Shabbat? Uh, maybe we'll do trading, right? So don't, you can't touch money, it won't lead you to a bigger sin. But we, with this money, with this coin and this dollar, what am I going to go? Buy a gum on Shabbat? Obviously not, no? So what's the problem? Is it still? It's in your pocket, there's no maritime. The answer it's not Mukze. Not Mukze at all. If it's Eruv, if there's an Eruv. If there's an Eruv, you can carry it. Okay, we went way too far. Ooh, ah, it's already 11. All right, any question before we finish? Huh? 11-12. 11-12. You don't have to put more salt on the wounds. 11-12. <laughs> Something, it's called Muktze Michamat Chisron Kis. Something extra valuable like a special knife. So maybe you shouldn't carry, you shouldn't carry 
Yeah. Yes, you're right. It could be that because it's Muktzah Mihamas Chisron Kis, you're right. But if you walk with that all year, all year round, every day for protection or for blessing, yeah, on a chain maybe. Okay, uh, thank you very much for being so patient. But don't forget, I pushed two lectures into one <laughs> without you realizing. We'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Baruch Adonai Amen v'amen.